in them and help them through that process and this is how change will occur. And a lot of people think it's going to be slow, but it isn't, you know. But all it requires is 10 people to affect another 10 people and those 10 people to affect another 10 people. Imagine if this happened over a period of, say, three years, each 10. 10 affect 10, affect 10, affect 10, affect 10. How many times is it before you've got 6 billion people affected? It's not very long. 12 years, 15 years, and 6 billion people are going to know all about this. That's how fast it's going to be. AJ, uh, when the lady asked you about how you were feeling after your six weeks, well, after I saw you at Ublo and you said you were going bush to do your thing, <laughs> yeah. I made the intention that I was going to try as hard as I could to start this process and continue it. I have thought about you every now and then and you kept me on the track. Yep. And today you talk about how you feel now after processing for six weeks. I was just sitting here and all of a sudden I felt something and I turned around and you were sitting there and you looked straight at me and we smiled. And I thought, wow, you certainly looks different, feels different. Yep. I didn't even know you were in the room. Yeah. But I felt you different. Yeah. You know, and I, I know that I have uh, friends who say to me, um, hey, you look really good. And I'm thinking, I'm so high. <laughs> I'm so out. Yeah. But my aura, if you want to call it that, is pretty good. And everything's relative, isn't it? Like, exactly. compared to how you were a month ago, yep. you might be, you know, you might be feeling a bit down, but when everyone looks at you, they think, you're definitely better than you were a month ago yeah, when I saw you last. Right. Yeah. yeah. So and it's definitely not something to explain, it's just something to feel, both from someone and inside yourself. Totally. Yeah, yeah totally. So thank you. Uh, up the back, sorry. I just want to know, like, the more attraction, why is it Um, God made a process um, that certain that there are certain souls that have been created just to incarnate on this earth. So, so what what will happen is those souls will incarnate whether the earth condition is poor or good. They will just continue to incarnate. And in fact, that's the only way that the human body can actually survive is to have an attachment of a soul. So, so the way the whole process is made is that. The soul attaches to the two, the spirit and physical forms, and comes comes into the earth plane, if you like, to experience itself and to gain a conscious awareness. Now, every soul has that instinctual quality, and every soul before that state doesn't know that they're entering a state that's full of this damaging, loving, unloving emotions. It's only once they enter the state that they start feeling those unloving emotions. And um, there's a lot of factors determining attraction to divine truth, right? Uh, the first one is being humble, humility. And um, a lot of people are seeking truth, but they have a very, very firm outline in their mind what that truth is already before they begin seeking. So my, my parents were... Um, my mother was looking for truth, for example, when I was just a child. And she investigated lots and lots of Christian faiths. Right? So she already had a feeling inside of her mind and heart that the truth had to be in a Christian faith. Does that make sense? Like There was already this predisposition to find it in that location. And so the majority of people do have predispositions of finding truth in certain locations. The other issue is that all of you are seekers of truth. And you will be surprised how many people in the, in the world, and in the universe in fact, are not seekers of truth. Just because you are one, it doesn't mean that the next door neighbour that you have is automatically one. 
a lot of times what we do is we judge other people by our own conception of ourselves. So what happens when a person's a seeker of truth? You automatically believe that everyone's a seeker of truth. Are you saying that at our core some people just... I mean, how can it be that you don't want to know the truth? <laughs> um, these two states are... Oh, by the way, the humility state is not necessarily a state of... Um, error created by our incarnation. Because Ammon and Amman, the first human couple, did not exercise humility and they were perfect. They were perfect human couple at the six fear level and yet they didn't exercise humility. The, right now, the most perfect people in the universe without God's love are in the six fear of the spirit world. And there are literally billions of spirits in that state. <laughs> They are not in a state of abundance with God, although some of them believe they are. And they are not in a state of humility, although many of them believe they are. Now, humility and seeking the truth are not to do with erroneous emotions that exist within you. These qualities exist within you, whether you have erroneous emotions or not, within so you. some people don't have that quality, like my... Some people have not developed these qualities. But aren't they inherent? No. Wow. There are some qualities that are not inherent that you must develop. In fact, the majority of qualities from God's perspective are all developed. You think about it. If God's love... If these people had automatic humility and they're automatic seekers of truth and they're living in the sixth sphere of the spirit world, would not they be automatically receiving divine love? Thinking because of soul damage that we wouldn't want to go there. But they don't have soul damage. They're free of soul damage. So why don't they want to receive divine love? I don't know. <laughs> Nor do I. Do they think they are? Some of them think they are, certainly. Some of them want to believe they are already in that state. Many all of the many of the ones that I've met in the sixth fear myself. Have all, want, have all believed they're already at one with God. But they know there's fears above them that they can't get to, but they don't understand why. I've had explained to me one of the reasons why was that the spirits that are above the sixth fear are a different type of spirit or a different type of person. They've, I've had some explain to me in my... I'm talking in the 2,000 years of my existence. I've had lots explain to me that it actually I and them were made differently right at the beginning. I've had others explain to me that I'm just a frivolous piece of <laughs> fluff <laughs> that, uh, that God will let go anywhere because I'm not that important. I've had people say that to me. So when they pick up on your energy? Oh, certainly. If they allow it. Is it just as simple as, I'm a non-smoker. I wanted my children to be non-smokers, but they're both smokers, so I have no um, control over that. Well, that's a bit different because you do have control over it because it's an emotion driving your children to smoke, and that emotion possibly was created by your yeah. either environment, yeah, but which mean, you were created. Like no, nah, yeah, it's very true. You can't yeah. seek. You know, they've been told over and over, you know, that smoking's bad for them and all these other things, right? You know, and yet they still do it. Why? Because they. Because they want to. Because yeah. <laughs> they want to. Has God create, created any soul with a consistent quality? Like, do we have a consistent quality of thread that runs through? Oh, there's some basic consistent qualities. One, one is everyone at the heart level has a desire at some point to connect to God. They often misinterpret okay. right. that desire. And every, some, every person at some level has a desire to connect to their soulmate, but often they misinterpret that desire. But those two desires are very basic desires. Every person at the soul level has a will and they are recognised their will eventually. Every person at the soul level has that. But how you exercise your will is very individual. Very individual. And God doesn't control it, nor does God want to. That's why he gave you your will. Because <laughs> he wants to be free with that. Uh, come on, sorry. Can you, get, um, can you receive divine love without realising it? Um, you can't receive divine love without realising it at the soul level. But you can certainly receive divine love and not intellectually realise that you've received it. Many Christians are in this state where they've actually 
they've had huge emotions towards God of wanting God's love to enter them they've actually had God's love enter them but they've misinterpreted the event and they think it's something else right? so that happens for many people certainly many people who are non-Christian have, have you know had that state you hear of many Muslims or Buddhist or or um, uh, Hindu of the Hindu faith having these moments where they've actually felt divine love into their soul right but but it, because they don't know how to recreate it they think it has something to do with their faith that's something to do with their particular religious stance that caused them to receive that at that moment you refer to Christians on many occasions what do you call yourself a seeker or a spiritualist <laughs> <laughs> I don't call myself anything I'm just a man right um, yeah like the truth is that I never want, wanted a label to be placed on what I was teaching in the first century, although after my death they called it the way. And what, I, what they meant by that was it was the way to God. Right? Remember, um, in the first century I gave many illustrations about the different paths. There were, I said there was a broad and spacious path leading off into the road of natural love, right? and lots and lots every single person almost following that path and then I said there was a narrow way leading to life and few are the ones finding that right and that was what I was talking about this way of divine love this way of divine truth the way that is being explained to you can you see why it's narrow yes. you can feel it's narrow can't you yeah. not many people <laughs> want to do it do they and even yourself sometimes you don't want to do it either right and it is a narrow way, but it's, it's the way God made for you to connect to God. Right? And that was the way God wanted to teach Amon and Amman about right back in the first time. But they rejected that way because they wanted there to be a different way, <laughs> their own way. And this is where it gets down to God reliance versus self reliance. And so when we talk about the way what I'm talking about the way of divine truth or the way of divine love that's the same thing that we talked about in the first century the way of life and that's why I said in the first century and this is going to trigger a number of you I am the way and the truth and the life and what I meant by that was that by my own possession of divine love standing right in the midst of them and I said to them that the kingdom of God was in their midst and they did not even know it what I meant was, right at that time, was my life was a demonstration, right, that this divine love existed for every single person who has ever lived on earth or in the spirit world. This divine love was there waiting to enter them, and I was the living proof standing right in front of them that it had, that it had been offered to them. Right? And all they needed to do was to listen to what I'd already been taught about it, and they would also be able to experience the same thing. And that's what I'm suggesting to you really now. I'm saying, listen to what I've been taught about it. I've been taught like you've been taught. I, it didn't just like, I, I don't have all of this truth just, uh, you know, coming to me because I'm unique or special in some way. I've just been taught the same way, but I've just been taught by God just like you can be taught by God. And the divine love will enter you and you will feel the truth as a result of it. And it's exactly the same thing as I said in the first century. Exactly the same thing. In the first century, did you have your followers clear their emotions the way you're suggesting us now? I tried to help them clear their emotions, but there was lots and lots of resistance, as you can imagine. Quite often, I'd be walking along to another, like, to another town, and, and the, my friends would not be walking with me. They'd be walking, like, a hundred yards behind me, arguing and fighting amongst themselves about what I'd just said to them, <laughs> right? And having a huge disagreements. And in fact, there, there was a whole series of times when, you know, they wanted to report me to different people and cause trouble for me and all sorts of things because of what I'd said to them, right? right? So there was a lot of resistance in the first century, much more resistance than there is now towards listening to truth. That's why you've come back now. Because... Yeah, because the, the world is like primed now. Yeah. There are so many seekers of truth now right that really want it in their heart and it's an ideal time to present the truth again 
And you'll find because of everyone being in this new place of seeking, the world being in this space of seeking and exercising, exercising their will to change, that things will change quite rapidly as a result. This is size, wasn't it? Yeah. Yep. The trouble is though, you've got um, religions who say, you know, the second coming, but unless it's their puppet and they've um, orchestrated it, they're never going to believe that you're Jesus, are they? Well, I don't know about never, but well, well, hopefully <laughs> for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Obviously, when I get in a condition of a one minute again, and I start feeling, you know, the feelings that I was feeling in the first century, and then others of the 14 do the same, and others of yourselves do the same, obviously there'll be huge amount, and you know, you start healing people, and you start, you know, doing all these different things that are an automatic result of being in that condition. You know, sooner or later, how's anybody going to not hear about it? And how's anybody going to reason their way out of that? You know, in the end, it's going to be difficult for them. Can I just ask a question about the Dalai Lama? Yep. And the whole process in the Buddhist religion in that respect of reincarnation and yep. him reincarnating over and over. Yep. Um, who is it actually coming back to? Is it a new soul each time? No, no, yep. What's happened is that let's say there's the soul, the new soul reincarnating. Reincar so the new Dalai Lama, if you like. Here's his spirit form and here's his material form. What, uh, there are a group of spirits in the spirit world who are all the old Dalai Lamas, if you like. Right? They're all spirits in the spirit world. All, what they do is they, they look for a person on earth who is mediumistic, who they can impress all of their memories and all of their feelings and everything upon over a period of time, usually the first 10 years of their life. So what they do is they impress upon each one, this soul, this new soul that they've found that's very impressionable, all of their memories and experiences and feelings and everything over that period of time. So this soul, by the time it's 10 to 15 years of age, is in a very highly developed natural love state, having received all of this help and assistance and memories of all of these different spirit of all of these different spirits, and they do that to continue the lineage of the Dalai Lama as a leader, a spiritual leader for the Tibetan people, and it's totally orchestrated by the spirit by spirits in the spirit world Where are they in the uh, many of these are in the sixth sphere so they're in a very very good natural love condition perfect natural love condition yeah and it's their way of impressing this natural love condition upon the earth and they have a very very strong desire to continue that process many of the Dalai Lamas historically have become like have actually gotten onto the divine love path and so they don't get involved in that process. It's only the ones that are still on the natural love path that are involved in that process. But how can this be right when the soul, the physical person, has, is impacted in their free will? Well, remember, when a child is a child, it's really impacted by the free will of its parents. So many of the parents have a desire in their heart for, the next, for their child to be the next Dalai Lama, right? Well, naturally so, wouldn't you feel? Like, it's a, it's a very, na sort of a natural desire, in a way. And so they have a natural desire for them to be the next Dalai Lama, and so that creates a spiritual condition of openness in this person, in this child's soul, that allows this influence to occur. So is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, look, if we're talking about, is it harmonious with divine love? No. Otherwise, these people wouldn't be in the sixth sphere, they would be in the celestial spheres, right? But is it harmonious with natural love? Yes, totally harmonious with natural love. Because they yeah. take the child to an environment that they can control so that it doesn't have to deal with the everyday ups and downs. Yeah, their viewpoint is that they're actually <coughs> protecting this child and nurturing this child the best they possibly know how, and this child will not have to experience many of the things that many Tibetan children do experience yeah. because of the influence of these. So they see it as a very loving act. Right? Not only a loving act for this child, but they also see it as a very loving act towards, the, towards any person in the Buddhist faith and even towards the world of mankind generally. Because they're transmitting all of this natural love information through this person to the world, which is changing the world. Like the Dalai Lama has changed many people through their, their teachings, right? And, and so it has had a positive effect. So the way these these spirits reason it is that we are having a positive effect on the earth.
And this is happening, by the way, not just with the Dalai Lama. This is happening with hundreds of different, of different spiritual gurus, particularly in the Indian ways, all through history. Yeah. yeah. Happening you know, constantly. Attachment is probably one of the biggest misconceptions, you say? Or yeah, well, the beauty of the Dalai Lama is that these spirits step back at a certain age. So they love, they love the child, nurture them to a certain point, step back after that point. And, and many Dalai Lamas actually explain the experience of the stepping back. They can remember that experience. And the issue is with a lot of the other types of uh, religious gurus who are being totally overcloaked, is that the spirits never step back. And they are constantly operating through the individual every waking hour or as many waking hours as they possibly can without harming the person physically. And so, you know, there are different things going on, but, you know, I feel the way the Dalai Lama is being handled is, is a lot more loving, perhaps, than the way some others are being handled. Mm. Up the back, thanks. Um, you look like you've got all the Dalai Lamas there, and they're, like, hanging out in the same space, and one pops upstairs and gets, gets to the bigger, better place, <laughs> then why don't they follow and, like, you know, naturally wouldn't we want to get to an even better place, even if you're happy where you are? Like, Will you imagine for a moment that uh, you've had a certain religious belief all the time that you've had on the earth, you pass over in the spirit world, and that religious belief has helped you to get to the sixth sphere of the spirit world as well. So in other words, you've progressed through the spheres, into the sixth sphere, through this religious belief. Through, in, in, your, in your feelings, that's what you feel, through this religious belief. So you're now in this space where you actually... Um, feel totally and believe totally that your religious belief has been the instrumental thing that's actually gotten you to the condition of happiness that you feel you're in. How difficult is it going to be for you to give that up? Very difficult. I imagine conditions are pretty good at the sixth sphere. There are excellent conditions in the sixth sphere. You can create any reality you want through your desire. You're just not yet at a condition of one with God. You can create lots of different things in the sixth sphere. It's a beautiful place. Remember in the second channeling that Natalie did in the Udlo DVDs? Remember how the spirit, uh, what was her name? Lucinda. Lucinda, Lucinda described the sixth sphere? That it was like sideways movement through these different amazing experiences? And a feeling she had of progressing, but then she realised after a while that it was all just experiencing the same thing in a different way? And that's what they feel in the sixth sphere. And so, in the sixth sphere, it is very, very hard for you to give up what got you there. She had to go back to the third sphere she, to progress. She had to go back to the third and exercise a real so humility. A, that's a big give up. That's a big give up. Mm. You're talking... Do they have emotional garbage? Do they still have emotional stuff that they need to clear in order to move on beyond there? How does that work? No, it's not so much emotional stuff, but there are some basic things that they are still needing to develop. One is being a seeker of truth. Yeah. One is having complete humility. One is go, uh, having the feeling of, um, what do you call it? The feeling of, underst of understanding that they have this... Many of them have suppressed their desire for God, okay. right? They're in a perfect natural love condition, but suppressed desire for God. And they don't let that desire grow, because when that desire just grows a little bit, they feel dissatisfied and they feel they're no longer perfect if they're dissatisfied, and so they don't let that desire grow. Does that make sense? And so there's a lot of limiting things that are occurring in the sixth sphere, not allowing a person to grow spiritually. And when they go back to the third, some of those get opened. The desire for God, for instance, gets opened. It's one of the things that get opened. If they've gone through the development of all their emotions and have gone you know, to get to the level of the sixth sphere, yep. would it you imagine there? you imagine you've got millions of things you can create and do for a moment you just imagine that state you can distract yourself with anything you want you can create lot like you can even create planets and you can create physical things and you can you can do these amazing amazing things right imagine that for a moment you can investigate any thing intellectually that you want and you can be fascinated for hundreds of years in one particular phase of investigation 
Can you imagine how easy it is to be distracted from a yeah. little tiny feeling inside of you? Yeah. Oh, that, 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 that something might be missing here. Yeah. Can, you, can you see that? Yeah. And that's how they feel. Well, how would they feel towards the Dalai Lama that has moved on? Do they think that, his, that he was an error? Thinking there's a lot of different. There's a lot of different feelings they have. They feel sometimes that they've been, that he betrayed the faith. So some of them feel like it's a betrayal of how they got there. So that there's got some of those kind of so feelings. What does he say? Well, if I'm moving on to be bigger and better things, and they say there is no big, bigger and better things. No, they no. They say no. They say they look at it intellectually. They say, oh no, it's just another thing of what we're doing. Do you know what I mean? They think it's the same sideways movement they've always done. So they don't see it as anything different. And they're happy enough doing what they're doing and they don't allow themselves to feel a feeling of dissatisfaction. The, I've had times where I've spoken to six sphere spirits and they have moved on to the spirit to the seventh sphere by going back to the third and then progressing. But only when I've connected them to their feeling of dissatisfaction in their relationship with God. And when I've connected them to that, that's when they've changed. But, but it, many of them tell me they're not, dis they're not dissatisfied at all with their relationship with God. They have a perfect relationship with God. Right? But the feeling I'm getting from them is totally different. I can feel no, no, And I say to them, no, no, no. You let yourself be truthful here and feel that feeling that I can feel from you. You know, that feeling that's inside of you. There's this feeling of I'm not really, really content here. Because you've put that there, sooner or later they will feel it. Yep. Yep. It took, uh, like Socrates and, and uh, Plato, it took them about nearly a hundred years for them to actually, for that seed to be dropped into them before they actually changed. It took, both of those men are now celestial spirits, right? But it took them nearly a hundred years from the time the Apostle John met them, because he's the person who met them. He dropped the seed into them that maybe you're dissatisfied. And it took them nearly a hundred years of our time on earth before they got to that point where they recognized that dissatisfaction. Right. And once they recognized the dissatisfaction, they called John back to them again and he explained to them what the dissatisfaction was all about. And they <coughs> progressed very rapidly after that. Yeah. When you say progress very rapidly, I think I read somewhere where you said that you, you took 2,000 years to get the 20 seconds. Yeah, because I'm slow. Well, it's true, the first person's always slow. Yeah, because you were the first person to reach sphere. Yeah. So you are, that's, you're that's, right. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's a, there's a lot of seeking within your personality, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 the, um, and I was the slowest person to reach every sphere because it, the, the nature of being the first is you're, the, you're, the, you're doing all these, these investigations it's a bit like the first persons who flew. Yeah. You know, how many years did it take them to get yeah. to that point and how much ridicule did they get and how much, you know, just, it was just constant barrage for them. And then they proved you could fly. Then how long did it take before there were flying machines in a war? From that point to that point was less than 10 years. And that's what really happens. Talking about from an aspect of this planet, first person from this planet. To fly. Yeah, to reach. Yeah, 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 not not other planets. No, no. Yeah. Um, yeah. When, when you pass, yep. who decides where you go? Um, no one decides where you go except your soul condition. So whatever is the you have a guide, yes. Your guide will remain with you even after you've passed, but your soul condition will determine where you go. And you'll actually be told, I will take you to your home now, and here is your home and this and the first thing you'll remember is the words that I've just spoken to you. My home is a reflection of my soul condition. And you know what's going to happen for many of you? You'll look at that home and say, boy, I must look pretty good in my soul. <laughs> because your home will be really, really pretty, right? And wonderful. And you'll be so blown away by it that you'll be so impressed with already the development that's in your soul. Right? But your soul will be taken to the location that your soul condition can reside in. And afterwards? afterwards, you can progress as much as you want, as fast as you want, or as slow as you want, just like you can here. But you're alone. Uh, not necessarily. How can you ever be alone in a place that's got millions and millions of people? <laughs> like, you're not alone. No, no. 
No. You might feel alone because that emotion still might be in you. Can I just come back to emotional processing for a second? There's a man up the oh. back who's been put in far away. Um, why, I why was Australia chosen, chosen for your reincarnation? Um, there are a lot of countries on the earth today that are more open spiritually to, uh, than other countries. And, and there are certain countries also that we felt would have a very fast uptake, if you like, of the divine love path. And so we chose specific countries uh, for specific reasons. And not, not just those two reasons. There are other reasons included in the uh, decisions that were made, including the safety of the majority of the 14. You don't want to reincarnate, you know, get to 20 years of age and die, and then you know, the whole process has sort of, in a way, been a bit of a waste. You know, We didn't want to do that either. So there's a lot of reasons. But Australia is one place where there is a lot more openness and a lot less rigidity about belief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? so, and that's a very positive thing. That's a part of Australia. Um, with your reincarnation now, um, is that in any way connected to like, the end of the world and is there any such thing? Because I've just been mm -hmm. hearing people say it and there's a little bit inside of that that's all that's there. Um, I suppose it is connected to the end of the world. <laughs> it's the end of the world as you know it. Don't you want this one to end a bit? And yes, you want a new one to come along? Yes, Don't you want that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Not, not the way um, it was, you know, it's not going to burn with fire and all those kind of things, obviously. Um, it is the end of the world as we know it, though. The world that, the world that you have right now in front of you, that you're a part of, that's passing away. Not in a, not in a physical sense. <coughs> But in a spiritual and emotional sense, the world that we're so used to being experiencing right now is just passing away. And, and in front of your eyes, a new world will become. It will become totally different than what you're currently feeling and experiencing in this world. And it will become different because of you leading the way into this place of full emotional openness and honesty, full, of, full truth, connection with God, love emanating from you. That's why it will change. So, but in terms of, are we going to experience cataclysmic events? Yes, we are. Right? The reason why is because the world has been damaged so much that there are going to be some adjustments that are going to be required. The how world, soon? well, in terms of how soon, I don't know. It just depends on your soul condition. The faster you change, the more, the less the damage is going to be. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because as your condition of love rises, you are now influencing lots and lots of things around you, including the earth. And as that condition of love rises, what's happening is the damage that's being done to the earth is lessened by huge amounts, which means that the events that might have been cataclysmic 10 years ago or five years ago now might be quite minor in comparison. Now, you know, five years ago or so, it was looking like a third to a half of the world's population would pass with these events. But as people take up the divine truth, deal with their emotions, change what's being spread out to the world, what's happening is, all of a sudden, there is a different projection going on on the earth, yes. and that's going to have a huge effect on that. So, so the truth is there are going to be some cataclysmic events. But the way to reduce them is do your soul work. Is this the manifestation of the parable of the silly virgins and the ones who had their yes. oil within their lamps and the ones who missed missed the timing of everything? Missed yeah. the, the marriage of the bridegroom to the bride? Yep. Yeah. Are you getting married soon? Am I getting married? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Two minutes. Um, all of these events that are going to occur in the future will be very much impacted by your soul condition and the impact upon your life will very much depend upon your soul attractions. So my suggestion is deal with these emotions when it's easy to deal with them and not when you're under pressure to deal with them. Deal with them while, you know, while you've got the ability to create an environment that is supportive of you dealing with them. You know, take the opportunity to do that now. I asked you about um, 
I feel a mixture is important because your law of attraction will trigger the emotion. Once the emotion is triggered, deal with that on your own. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, and, and some emotions you will need to deal with with others. Like, for example, um, I've found like some, emotion, some people are triggered a lot just by giving them the hug. So, you know, they have a big cry because they're getting hugged. Yeah. Other people, you give them a hug and it shuts them down totally, doesn't yeah. it? So you've got to be very sensitive to, to what's going on within people. But generally, yes. Generally, you get a trigger and then you'll be off on your emotion. Be in a space where you can fully experience it. Yeah. Very tired is a good time to experience your emotions. Yeah, who's found that when they get very tired, they get overwhelmed? Yeah, and when they get overwhelmed, they connect. Yeah, it's a very good time actually. Tired, you see, a lot of times we have so much resistance within us that it's only at pressure times that we actually break. We let ourselves break. We let ourselves be overwhelmed. So, like for a woman, tight period time, right? Very good time for you to deal with some causal emotion. Because that's a time when you do feel overwhelmed with whatever anger or shame or whatever other feelings like that are going on in your body. And it's a time of triggers, right? So let yourself be triggered with them. Go for it, you know? In that way you've got some advantages over fellas, right? Let when you're tired. Very good time. Your guard is down. Your guard's down, you can't hold it back. You're really struggling to, you know, keep things under control. You don't need to control. This is, you know, you just need to let it all just come out of you and have a good cry while you're at it. Right? So let that happen. There are lots of times like this. Tristan, yeah, hot and bothered. Hot and bothered, and conversely, cold. <coughs> Cold and miserable, yeah. yeah. Is it, these are all good times, right? Extremes. Where we, we're subjected to physical extreme mm -hmm. and it triggers something inside of us. Yep. Go out in nature and let yourself have a few ants over your body and a few other things like that. You get triggered about that, about a few things. <laughs> When I was standing up with you, I could feel my, uh, I could feel things flying very easily and smoothly. Yep. Um, when I'm, if I witness something very joyous or beautiful, tears will come very easily, tears of joy. Yep. If something is challenging me, even if I, I try to st stay with what's going on, I don't get near the tears stage. Mm. So in other words, there's a feeling inside of you that I'm allowed to cry when I'm joyful, right? Loud to cry when I'm joyful, so I'm allowed joy, but I am not allowed grief. So what you need to do is allow yourself to start looking at this. Why are you not allowed grief? You'll find that there's some very, very strong childhood impressions that were put upon you by your parents that told you that this was fine, this ain't fine, and you still have those beliefs. And allow yourself to address those beliefs. Yeah. Um, if I was asked about my childhood, I would say I had a good childhood, I was well looked after. But Ray was asking me what I could remember. I can hardly remember anything about my childhood. Your, One or two things from when I was four, maybe that's it. Your parents are what I would classify as caring parents in a, in a strictly uh, sort of the way the world would define them. Yes, yes. But actually there were heavy projections upon you yes. that certain things were not allowed and certain things were allowed yes. and when they were not allowed there was an emotional projection at you about that not being allowed. And that's what you're dealing with. And the reason why you're finding it so hard is because you can't identify a thing where you're actually treated badly that it's related to but there was just this constant projection upon you that, you, that is so normal for you and, and that's why it's difficult for you to address those particular issues. Yeah, my father was a conservative. Uh, I, I witnessed very little, real deep emotion yes. in my parents. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And a motion was, avo as a, was avoided by your parents. Yes. They avoided a motion. And so you were taught to avoid certain emotions. Now you're allowed the emotion of joy because that's something you allow yourself to experience. Yes. But you're not allowed the emotion of grief. So look at what blockages there are. Because remember I said before, the biggest pain in this whole process is not feeling the actual emotion. It's feeling the... It's what Mary what brought up. Feeling the judgment and resistance. And th this is what this is about. You know, it's about feeling that judgment and resistance. Yep. And I used to put a um, dressing gown over my head to be a ghost, like yep. everyone else. Yep. And um, that fear I feel now of, like, if I'm walking down the side of my house and then, like, I've got a nice garden, it's a beautiful place, but even that feeling of that there might be something Spirits like around. energy, mm -hmm. even though I know that I feel quite protected yeah. in so many different regards and very well looked after. Yeah. I still have a sense that from because I'm always referring back to childhood yeah. in that sense of, you know, some, something there, something kind of loose. So it's a childhood feeling of being unsafe yeah. in relation to spirits. spirits. And, and you'll need to allow yourself to connect to that childhood fear. You, you will be terrified for a a night or two perhaps yeah. and you'll feel trem you know you'll be trembling and terrified when you connect to that childhood fear because that's but will that bring that's what you're worried about yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the truth is you can just ask your spirit friends who are guiding you to protect you from any spirit influence while you're going through that particular state and let yourself just feel that particular state yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah. and when you release this state you'll find that you're actually quite mediumistic and you might be able to connect to spirits much, much easier and you'll actually be able to talk with even your guides. There's a lot of things blocking you from talking with your guides at the moment and this is, this is a major one. What's the deal with all the autism on the planet now, AJ? Um, autism is very much the result of the suppression of emotion in the parent and the child being so sensitive to the suppression of emotion in the parent Bye bye, by the way. No worries, my pleasure. Um, we'll be finishing off soon for everyone too, by the way. Um, autism is the suppression of emotion in the parent that, and the child is already quite sensitive to the suppression of emotion. So the child suppresses its own emotion as a result. I've got some friends in Tassie who have an autistic child and, and they're working through the issues and eventually I feel they're going to be really fantastic teachers about autism but they're working through the issues of every time they notice their child respond emotionally to an event, you know, by screaming or not uncontrolled, they look at themselves instead of looking at the child. Okay. And in the process, what they've found is every single time they've been denying an emotion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Hey Jay, um, if, some, if one is taking any kind of substance or even using food suppressing, yep. Uh, certainly, but some substances are going to be more tricky to go through the process than others. For, uh, just to give you some examples, let's say I'm drinking myself to oblivion every night with alcohol. And um, of course, there must be an emotion I'm denying to do that, yeah. right? And so, so if I took away the alcohol, what would happen pretty fast? The emotion will get right to the core, wouldn't it? So you can approach the sub subject in two different ways. One way is I can choose to withdraw from the addiction and, and I, this, like who was I speaking to earlier about the addiction of trying to please others? Oh, somebody, oh, it might have been one of the ladies who just left, but um, I'm talking, we have all sorts of addictions, not only just food or alcohol or, you know, or substances, we also have addiction to feelings. And so what I'm saying is you can take away that feeling that you're trying that you're addicted to and see what emotion rises or you can try and deal with the emotion while you're still trying to have the addiction now which one's going to be easier do you think to identify the emotion first one. the first one yeah. yeah but that's actually a fast way of getting uh, you know. yeah what i did is i just threw away all addictions uh 
and uh, let everything come up to come up and uh, pretty rapidly everything came up and uh, for, for instance I had this large uh, collection of wine quite a few thousand dollars worth of wine I used to love red wine and uh, as soon as I realized what I wanted to do with my emotions I just saw I didn't sell it I just gave away my red wine collection right? and so um, and, and then I didn't have any wine like no, but I went through this process because I wanted to, what would that trigger, you see what that triggered, you know, and it's triggered a lot of things, <laughs> things you wouldn't even imagine, like I go out with somebody and they're all drinking wine and I say no, how does that feel? <laughs> it feels like I'm missing out, it feels like, like there was all sorts of things that triggered uh, just by doing that one thing. Mm. So my suggestion is allow yourself to identify your addictions and then remove them for a period. So like in the last few weeks I realised I was using addiction of carbohydrates to keep suppressed some emotions about my unworthiness. So what I did was I just stopped all carbohydrates. All the time I'm at my tent, all I have is lemon drinks, drinks with a bit of lemon squeezed in them, and, and, a, uh, and a few sprouts and, and, and a piece of fruit in the morning. And I found doing that Emotions come up, no worries whatsoever. And I feel like I feel like one of my addictions has been a packet of chips, you know, just like something like starchy, some some kind of carbohydrate. And and I I'm walking up to the house, you know, after being down the tent and I'm thinking about this packet of chips. <laughs> so I know that there's some more there, you know, just yeah, just some more stuff, more emotions to do with there. Well, look alright. <laughs> yeah, now I get plenty. Um, I feel the best I've ever felt, so um, I'm getting plenty of nourishment. And actually, I'm putting on weight, believe it or not. So, I'm putting on muscle weight because I'm dealing with all the unworthiness that. Yeah, because I, I'm dealing with the unworthiness that prevented me from putting on weight. Yeah. So I'm eating less and actually putting on muscle. Whereas, like I used to do bodybuilding, like this was ten years ago, and and. I had to go through rings to put on a kilogram of muscle. Like I had to just like, I ate six meals of meat a day <laughs> to put on some muscle. <laughs> and I did that for nearly six years. And I did put on some muscle, I was about 80 something case, but, but I, I still didn't feel good. I was all constipated and a mess really inside <laughs> of myself. <laughs> and I did it all, you know, this other way that never worked. And now I'm actually putting on muscle even though I'm just, well, I'm eating a lot less and yeah, so just dealing with the soul stuff. Yeah. Jen? What do you think about the addiction of meditation? Um, I feel it's just the same as any other addiction. Um, take it away for a while and see why you're doing it. Um, so if you're meditating to get away from your emotional condition, you'll soon, that'll soon be exposed. If you're meditating to get into your emotional condition, that's great. So it just depends. Um, re my suggestion is replace meditation with prayer and see where that takes you. So replace meditation with actually longing for God's love to enter you and what see where that takes you. What about the martial arts like Tai Chi and those other? Do you think that they're suppressing or does it depend on your intention? Do you think that I feel that anything that connects you to your body will connect you to your emotions. So it's great connecting with your body. Uh, look at the intention behind it though. If the intention is to harm somebody else, then obviously there's some spiritual aspects to that particular thing that you need to look at closely. Hmm. Remember every decision is based on... Based on... Every decision is based on... Love, love, love. We're talking about love. <laughs> Love. Every, every, everyone's based on love. So, so ask yourself in any decision you make, is this a loving decision towards myself, towards my body? Is this a loving decision towards someone else? Is this a loving decision that I'm making? And if it's not, ask yourself, what emotion in me causes me to want to make an unloving decision? And let yourself go with that, you know? Yeah. Can I just... Uh,
How do you feel when you go there comforting her? Do you feel... Well, there's times where I feel really resentful and I don't want to be there and I'll leave because I don't... Good. Care. Don't go there when you feel resentful because that's not love. Yes. Yeah. And so, and I feel torn because the times when I don't go, then I feel like, you know, I've let her down and all those sort of things. Yeah, well, that's the emotion that's being triggered in you. Yeah. And that's the emotion you need to feel. But the, the, my suggestion with your mother is that your mother does have many projections of requirements towards you that you are fulfilling. And when you don't fulfill it, you have this feeling come up. My suggestion is don't fulfill it for a little bit. Let her dump on you all the reasons, that, that guilt, and then go deeper into the guilt and into the sadness and grief that that guilt will trigger, and you'll release quite a lot of things. Doing that. So, so don't go down there? No, I'm saying, I'm saying don't go down there when you have a feeling of guilt to go there. Okay. Okay. When you have a feeling of love to go there, yeah. go there. Okay. Right, when it's a pure feeling of love, go there. If it's not a pure feeling of love, stay there with your guilt. Let yourself feel your guilt, go into your guilt, go into the sadness and the projections that are underneath that guilt. Because it's all about you being blamed and made responsible for other people's emotions. Which is what your mum is very good at doing with you. As you know. Yeah. Jen? Many times I get to a place where I don't know, I don't feel that it's like a complete I don't even know what to say. I, there's, it's, like, it's not that it's nothing. It's not like it's a void. Yeah. There's just nothing. Is it a place where you feel like you've lost your mind? Pretty much. Yeah, it's a pretty good place, eh? Hey? Um, it feels really confusing, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. What, what will happen, you see, what's going on for many of you, and you'll find this in your progression, is that if you're on the divine love path, Remember, here's your soul, here's your spirit body, the spirit body has its mind. Here's your material body, the material body has its brain. As you become soul-centric, if I could call it that, soul-centric, what actually happens is, this has to disappear. There's a transition phase that you will go through in your progression, where, where you stop thinking and your, think, your thoughts are your feelings, if that makes sense. All your feelings are your thoughts. Do you follow me? And, and to do that, you'll go through these periods where you can't remember things that you were doing intellectually before. Now, to give you an example, like one morning I woke up and I, got, I, was, I had a sports car at the time, right? Believe it or not, yes, I did have a sports car. And, and what I did was, this was like, uh, this was just when, after I started the divine love process, right? I ran out to the car to jump in it to go down the street. And I couldn't remember how to drive it. I just couldn't remember how to drive it. So I was just sitting there in the garage. And I, and I just w went through this, like, place where I, I didn't know what to do and then I you know I remembered the pedals <laughs> so you know I just had to get myself into the swing of things which took about a minute or two and then I could remember how to drive it again I have the same thing happening with my guitar playing at the moment I'll be playing away my guitar get quite good at it you know I deal with a series of emotions and then I'll pick up the guitar and I can't remember how to play the thing again yeah. Right? And, and it feels really distressing sometimes. Uh, it feels like every single progression I make. And really what's happening is a lot of what I've learnt has been at this level. And what's happening now is the things that you learn as you progress will be at this level. And so there will be times when there's a transition occurring between those two levels. Where, you know, sometimes it feels like you're, you know, in this real confused state. My suggestion is just allow with it, go with it. That's what I've had to do, just go with it. So are you losing then that feeling, those abilities that you learned from? I'm losing, I'm losing the intellectual abilities of doing all of those things and getting back to that being an ability of the soul. So what I know will happen at some point is I'll pick up the guitar 
and I'll be like a person who just picks up the guitar, goes ding 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 ding, and away it goes. Just like many people who do music do. Yeah. That's what I will do. Yeah. Is that genius? No, it's soul connection. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Where my, see, people are often channel soul in their passion, but don't channel soul in other areas. So if you have to learn something, generally that's not channeling your soul in that passion. You're learning it intellectually, right? But there are, there are times where you meet a person where they just obviously have a soul passion in a certain area and it's just natural for them, right? And what will happen at, when you get to the awamit condition, everything you start doing will feel natural because you'll have a passion for it and it will be automatic. So you'll learn very, very rapidly and you won't have to have this intellectual process of learning. Right? The intellectual process gets in the way a lot, right? But in the transition between you feel like you're just going nuts sometimes because the brain, the mind, the spirit body's mind is like no longer dominant and you're just losing this intellectual dominance and it just, it, it is very disconcerting. So like coming here today I had no idea what I was going to talk about and I was nervous about it because I didn't, because normally what I do is just at least plan a little <laughs> I have no idea what I was talking about and that happens in many groups I don't know absolutely what I'm going to do at all anymore and I'm getting to the point emotionally where it doesn't matter they're willing to help you because they want to help you but they feel you're making a mistake yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of you have six fear spirits around you still, or spirits on the natural love path around you, and they will project doubt at you, and they will project mistakes. You know that you're making mistakes. And in fact, I'd like to just mention to them that actually it's not a very loving state to project doubt at a person who you know is already in doubt. Do you follow me? Yeah. So, so for example, if you know at the heart level this person does want to do this but you know at the head level they have doubt about doing it and you project doubt at them, where do you think they're going to go with it? Aren't they going to end up with more doubt? Yeah, yeah. And if that, if that occurs, don't you think that's an unloving thing that you've just done? You've just led them away from their true soul desire? Yeah. How many times have you done that with their children, with your own children? Yeah. They come home and say, Dad, I want to be a fire engine driver. You know, and you go, what? <laughs> Well, I don't know if that's so practical, you know, or maybe you have this terrible thing about fire in your own feelings. No, no, don't you ever do that, you know, you can do anything else. And you'll, you'll inject doubt even into them. And what do they finish up doing? Going off and doing something that is not their passion. And of course that's going to affect their life, isn't it? And a spirit, spirits are often doing the same thing with you. So when you've got doubt, my suggestion is go into it emotionally, feel the doubt, <laughs> you know, let yourself work through the issue emotionally of what that doubt is and release it. But my suggestion to the spirits around you is let the person go through that process. Stop trying to tune them out of that process and get them on your process. Act in love. Love really would be enabling the person to do exactly what they want to do in that instant. That's what love will do, and if it's not breaking the laws of God, let them do that. And in fact, go with them with that. So that's... There's a lot of things I want to talk about with spirits, but we'll have to do that another time. Can you see them? No, no. Can you feel them? Yeah. Uh, I feel their... I feel... I don't actually... They don't transmit their feelings to me like they would do a mediumistic person. I've decided in this progression that I would have no spirit contact until I was at one with God. In the first century that was totally different. I had spirit contact all the way through. This time I decided no spirit contact till I'm at one with God. But what I do is I can only develop my own abilities to feel people's emotions. Right? So what I can feel spirits around us, what their different conditions in are and so forth, how many there are and all those kind of things. But I can't, I don't speak with them. Many of them try to speak with me and are confused that they are not allowed to. 
because um, they're used to being allowed to, but they're being prevented by my guides because of the choices that I've made. Tempted to change those choices? Oh, that one, yeah, certainly. I've been so tempted. Um, I, was, uh, I was so tempted because I felt so alone. Mm. And, and I knew in the first century that by the time I was developed even just to the second sphere, I could speak to spirits at any time I wanted. And I've really missed it. I've missed it terribly. And, but to be honest with you, I would never have dealt with my deep alone feelings if I had have done it. I would be constantly talking to them, trying to be reassured. So every time you do actually release a, a, a negative emotion, then you're reassuring of yourself that that was a good decision? Uh, yeah, not so much reassuring myself. I know after I've felt the emotion that, I, that it's a good decision because I would have relied on my spirits, on the spirits with me. It would have taken me. an easier path. Yeah, yeah, what? and not just an easier path, it would have been a path where I'd be tempted to stay in the same state. You know what I mean? Yeah, so I would have progressed a lot more slowly if I had chosen that path. Yeah. So I feel that I really related to the thing when you said that the wound of self-reliance, that really resonated with me. Mm. Aren't you sort of doing something similar there or are you still focusing on... No, on my feelings are, I just want to only rely on God. Right, okay, so this is all about me developing again okay, this okay, same okay, relationship okay. that I had with God and I want that relationship before I want any other relationship. And that includes any of the relationship with my friends who I feel very deeply about in the spirit world. But, and I've talked quite often to people who, you know, who know me more closely, know how much I have a burning desire to talk to them. Uh, but, I, but, but my desire is to connect to God first and then the other. Hmm. All of you are getting very tired now. So it's time to stop, I feel. And... Um, I'm not sure when the next uh, sessions will be uh, at all because I feel I need another good six weeks probably of my own work um, after I'll be doing a thing at Udlo next week on the 21st but um, probably will be late January, early February uh, before we look at uh, some new things and I'm not certain the format they will take either at this point because the changes I make between now and then might mean that things will change in that regard as well. Um, so if you aren't on any mailing lists or whatever, just if you let either Grant or myself know, um, and I'll put you on a mailing list and let you know what's actually happening. Um, have we received enough money to cover our expenses today? I haven't counted, but I'm sure we have. Yep, got enough. Um, there was about 12 or 15 bucks a person, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Four chair hire and video. Four chair hire and video and, and uh, venue, venue hire. hire. Yeah. So it's about fifteen bucks. So if you can if you can consider donating that just to cover the expenses of today, that would be lovely. And um, I'd like to thank while I have the opportunity, thank Grant very much for he's organised all of these sessions in Brisbane at his own time and his own personal expense. Yes. And I just feel that uh, I'd like to show my gratitude and, and to him for that. And um, so thank you very much. And it's just been wonderful because Grant um, Grant feels strongly str has felt strongly about the information being presented, so he wanted you to experience it too. So, so and that's an act of love on his behalf. So, it's just wonderful that he's done that, and I just wanted to acknowledge that. The um, uh, the coming subjects that I'll be discussing, I just would just briefly like to mention those to you. There'll be issues to do with soulmates again. There'll be issues to do with sexuality. There'll be issues to do with uh, receiving divine love with repentance and forgiveness and grace. There'll be an uh, issue of forgiving, how to forgive. Uh, there'll be stuff about humility, stuff about anger. Uh, so there'll be quite a wide variety of subjects. And one in particular is going to be my favourite, is how to deal with your children. Um, and in fact, what I'm considering doing is inviting you to bring along your children, if they're, particularly if they're younger children, you'll find it's going to be a very confronting session if you do that because I'm going to ask your children to tell you how they really feel about you <laughs> and to be really, really open and honest about it and I'll be encouraging them to speak their mind if I feel something in them that they're not voicing and we'll go with that, you know, and just... <laughs> Sorry? 
I'm not sure where, when we'll be doing it, but I think it will be probably around February-ish sometime. Uh, so that's another session that I'd like to, to do. You'll find your children are so good for you to work through stuff. And, and I just, it's so good to get you into the right zone with your own children about that. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do that session as well. So they are the kind of sessions that are coming up in the future. But um, I'm looking forward to seeing your progress, to be frank, you know. I know that many of you here are really starting to get into your emotional stuff. And I'm really, really happy to see that's occurring. And I know that you already have feelings of change within you and change within your law of attraction. Some of you are feeling quite distressed about your life and where it's going, and that's a natural thing that will occur through this process. So I'd like to just encourage you to keep going. Yeah. All right. But thank you very much.